thank you for your holy word. And as always, we invite your Holy Spirit to be here to open up the doors of the meaning of the words that are contained in the word that we're reading that you, you manifested to Moses that we might learn and understand the beginnings of our faith and to understand some of the people who are our ancestors, the originators of the faith. Mm -hmm. So open our hearts and our minds that we might understand and see your will and how you accomplish your work through them, even as you can with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. What book well, are we studying? So we're going to be doing Genesis 14 <laughs> Bible, through 16 yeah. <laughs> um, tonight. If, if we get that far, we really are kind of behind um, as far as being able, you know, we were pretty ambitious to get the chapters done, we were going to get done. So tell me what you guys think about what, give me some feedback on what you remember, things that you learned from the first parts of this. Uh, well, from the very beginning where there's the, what is it, not the Alpha the Omega, the other one. The Alatov? The Alatov, yeah, how that's sprinkled all over mm -hmm. yeah, from the very beginning. And then I think one of my favorite parts is the first line where when you broke it down, how it, um, the symbols of the Hebrew explain Jesus going to the cross to die for our sins. Yeah. Like from the very first line yeah. in the Bible, it's all in there. The very first word. Yeah, first word. Reveals that he was slain from the foundation of the world. It's very powerful. So we did some Hebrew. You know, we showed that each Hebrew letter has meanings and so forth. And we're going to even see a little touch of that tonight, not a lot. So just for the sake of the new people, person, <laughs> we're going to have other new people. I, I'm just going to do a quick review this new section going on. So. In Genesis 11, do you remember what that started with? Abram. Um, Abram's in the last part of that chapter. That was actually the Tower of Babel. Okay. Okay. Chapter 11 starts with the Tower of Babel, and it it talks about Nimrod um, becoming a Nephilim or becoming uh, what we could interpret as a, a Nephilim. Um, and that they were going to build a tower. It wasn't just a big giant building, you know, like you see in Sunday school class. It was talking about they were trying to make a gate into heaven, or a stargate is quite possible. We can easily translate it that way. Although we don't know for sure, from all the implications, it's the only thing that makes sense for God to come down and be so concerned about this thing they're building. Um, so... And, and Nick, just to catch you guys up and, and really uh, get a full understanding, if we don't understand the incursion of the angels and the pollution of the human blood, then we won't understand anything about the covenants, old or new. Mm -hmm. It's all about the blood. That's why it's called the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant was what? Broken. It was broken, but what was the Old Covenant? It's the law. Mm -hmm. Whereas Jesus said on the night in which he was betrayed, what did he do? He took bread mm -hmm. and wine, or grape juice, it was wine, and he said this cup is the new covenant, the new testament of my blood. Right. So there was an old covenant, we're going to see it beginning. We saw the first blood being shed with Adam and Eve after they sinned. God killed the animals and used their skin to cover them. So blood was shed for the remission of sin. It's one of the laws, the, the spiritual laws. So we want we want you to understand that. So what did the enemy do? The first thing he tried to do is to pollute the blood of humankind. Right. So that we couldn't have a Messiah or a Savior with perfect, uncorrupted blood. 
So that's the big battle all through the Old Testament of, of this bloodline. And that's why the genealogies, you know, uh, we had a comment that I hate reading the genealogies. Mm -hmm. And I think we all kind of find that a little bit boring until you look deeper into some of those genealogies. And you'll find some interesting things about their names and the message that their names give. We'll find a little bit about that tonight. Um, but but in, in, in the sense that of the genealogy, it was so important to establish that that bloodline is pure when it gets to the Messiahs. And that's the reason for it. That's the only reason, is he would have a pure bloodline so that, that the enemy and no one could, could say that he wasn't a true human. Right. You know, he wasn't part, you know, there wasn't angelic blood. Nephilim blood corrupting this bloodline, okay? So we always have to keep that in mind that this is this is God's goal. And again, we'll see that tonight. So in, in, in chapter 11, it starts with Abraham. He's with his dad in the Ur of the Chaldees. His dad is called out of Ur, and they go up to Haran, which, uh, and up in Haran um, is where they, they stayed until... Abraham's dad died, and then God called him to go into the Canaan, land of Canaan. Okay? So that's what we see in chapter 11. That's his beginnings. And then we see them moving. He comes down into the promised land in chapter 12. And, the, and he's there. He establishes himself, but then there's a famine in the land. And what's the first thing they do? They go down to Egypt, and he says to her, what? Tell him you're my half-sister because you're so beautiful. That will kill me, and they want to take... Pharaoh will want you for himself, so tell him you're, you're my half-sister. And, and why, does, why does he say, well, that's sort of a truth? Because here's, here's the genealogy. Right. So this is Abraham's dad. He has these three sons, and then by a second wife, he has Sarah. So he has these kids. Well, Abraham marries his half-sister. Right. So when he says, well, she's my sister, he's half telling the truth. Mm -hmm. right. But before God, it's, it's still a deception, right? Yeah. So Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, but not until, we'll see tonight, Abraham and Her Hagar have the son of the flesh, right? right? Ishmael. Right. Ishmael. And, and then Keturah comes after that, after Sarah dies. He remarries and has, has these kids. So in this line, and the reason we bring up the other sons, we want to see the intermixing of the marriage. So Abraham's brother Nahor marries his niece. <laughs> it really gets confusing. This is his niece. These are Haran's kids. He marries his niece and has these kids, and later on we're going to see see this line show up because Isaac is going to marry into Nahor's lineage. So it's all in the family, right? It, it, this, I, does, this helps to clarify yeah. the confusion, doesn't it, when you see the lines. So then uh, these two, he marries here. Laban has Leah and Rachel, and Jacob then marries them. So Isaac's son, you know, Isaac has Jacob and Esau, and Jacob marries again into the family, keeping the bloodline pure, okay? That's the whole thing. Now we see, that here's Ur, they travel up to here until Terah dies, Abraham's dad dies, and also Lot's dad dies during that time. So Lot is kind of adopted by Abraham. And they all move down into this area, okay? Then there's a famine. They go to Egypt, have this thing with Pharaoh where he lies, and then he is released from Egypt. So going back here, um, so chapter 13. So Abraham and Lot are down there, and Abraham is super, super rich. He has so many cattle, and, and Lot has prospered, and so forth, by this time. And by the way, most scholars believe that when Abr Abram and Sarai 
were in Egypt, that's when they got Hagar. Do you remember who Hagar is? <coughs> yeah, sure. Hagar is the handmaiden, or this basically the slave of Sarai. So he picks up a few people down there, buys a few, and heads back up from Egypt to where he is now. So Abraham and Lot, too many cattle for the land. It's too arid, so they decide there's Abraham's, I'm not going to put up with this fighting. I don't like strife. It's not good. It's not godly. You guys need to pick the land, and what you go either that way or that way, and I'll, I'll take what's ever left. So Lot of course, not thinking about putting Abram's best interest at heart. He's thinking about himself, and he looks at the Jordan Valley, and it says that valley is kind of like the Garden of Eden. It was so green. It was like the Garden of God. It was beautiful. So he chose the Jordan Valley. Okay? Now if we look... Yeah, did that work? No. There, the Dead Sea, it doesn't show up in this map, but the Dead Sea's here, and the Jordan goes along here. So he came over there, and I have a better map later on that I can show you. So now, we're, we come to chapter 14. And Lot's over there, and he moves into Sodom. You know, at first he's there with his tents and his herds, and everything's good, but then he moves into the city, and eventually he becomes one of the leaders of the city. He's on the town council of Sodom. <coughs> and so, you know, we see this gradual progression of compromise with Lot. And, and you'll see it costs him. You know, it costs him a lot because of that. Well, when the, in, in those days, when that's going on, it says now in Genesis 14, and it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasser, and Kederleomir, king of Elam, the and title king of Goyim. Goyim means nations. So we think that they think that title was the king of several tribes. You know, so he, he pulled them all together. And even to this day, the Jews call Goyim the heathens. The real, real translation is heathen. And they consider us heathen because we're not Jews. But we actually aren't heathen because we believe in the yeah. living God. So it's, it's a misnomer. So they made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bursa, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and, and I, those other kings. We don't, the reason I wanted to bring up their names, and I, I'm going to focus this, I could have skipped this, but I want you to look at something. You see, they came over from the area of Babylon, from the area where Ur, and, and, you know, Haran and Abraham all lived. And the reason, I, this gives an indication of the reason God told Haran, or um, what's, what's his dad's name? Oh, come on. Jack. What? Abraham's dad. What's oh, his name? Terah. Terah. Terah was told to leave, I personally believe, just in doing this study. He was told to, to leave because there were... This, there was another incursion of these angels. This, this blood was being polluted. The Nephilim had returned. And we'll see that as the case in these scriptures. It'll, it'll be identified. And you can tell by their names even that there is something going on here that is of evil. These are not pure humans in that sense. Amraphel means sayer of darkness, mysteries, curses. Now, he's the king of Shinar which is Babylon. Now, if you talk to masons of higher degree, they trace all their roots way back to Babylon. Babylon is where, you know, they get their dark secrets, secret societies, secret organizations. They come out from the very roots of this. It has never stopped. Those spirits have never, you know, left the earth in that says they're still influencing and they're sharing out of the what we call the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So they white witchcraft, black witchcraft, that's the white witchcraft is still eating out of the wrong tree. It's the tree, it sounds good, 
but it's still of evil. It's still from the wrong source of power. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, Ariok means lion-like. Have you ever seen what the sphinxes look like? You've seen those pictures. What, are the, right. what, are, what does the sphinx look like? Oh. It's a lion. The lion. Yeah. Yeah, the lion. The body. lion body, right. human head. So there is a mixture of DNA, and this guy was called lion-like. It's possible. We don't know. They could just say that that was maybe personality. his personality and his character. And the Keter Lamor, some people think this is Hammurabi because you can trace and go back and look at the names. And um, in, different, in different cultures, it's, it's the same one. If, you, if you're a history buff, you'll know the Hammurabi was very well known in uniting together the nations after the division of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, you know, the fall of Babel. And um, he established these sets of rules. And eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Yeah, really strict, legalistic, again, the kind of thing Satan would come up with, right? So, the next king, these four got together, was called a terror. His name meant terror or dread. Now that spirit of terrorism is still in the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. we, we even call it that. They're terrorists. They, this, this is the influence of this title. King of the Goyim. He's king of all these. He's gathered all these nations together. They're terrorists. All right. And, and I wanted to point this out because in my research and in my study, I found out that there are three artifacts actually in the British Museum. And their names have come up in these, on these scrolls and scripts. Hmm. The exact names that are in the Bible, oh. and so they verified them as in, in archaeology that these were real people. Like you can't believe the Bible, right? You have to have something else. But it's cool that there's proof saying, it "Okay, is. look, this is where it's at, and this is where you can find it." it. Is. And yeah. So the history of this war, they've actually found um, archaeological proof of this war in, cool. the, in the narrative of it, and you can go look that up. So they're fighting against these guys. Now Lot is living among these guys, okay? So the first one, Bera, he's the king of Sodom. And look what his name means, wicked toward heaven and man. This one, one who excels in wickedness in Gomorrah. That's the meaning of their name. This one, one who hates his father in heaven. That's Shinab. Oh yeah. And I found that one here, so I documented it. That's not Shinab. 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 And Adma from the earth, red or ruddy. So he probably was human, you know, because that's kind of what they call it's a derivative of Adam. So he probably was a human king. But mm -hmm. Shem Bar, infamous winged one. I found that fascinating. Yeah. His name means he's, you know, possibly a winged creature, or they named him after one of their gods that was a winged creature. In any case, it's wicked and evil. Oh. And then the king of Zor is not named. It means small. It means, okay, thank you. I know you had, he did his own. Lot, Lot wanted to be allowed to go to the town of Zor. Yeah, later. We'll get, you can, we'll be able small. to share that. Yeah. Oh, that was, oh nice, okay. Yeah. Okay, so all these came as allies to the Valley of Siddim, and that is the Salt Sea, and actually it's probably where the name of Sodom came from, okay? Twelve years they had served Keter and Leomor, so they were, they were kings that served under him. And I, in the middle of the night, in a dream, the Lord said, I kept saying, what do they call kings that are under other kings, and there's a name for it. It's in the Lord of the Rings. And I heard it in my sleep last night, and thought, oh yeah, I'll remember that. Of course, you don't remember when you get up in the morning. But these, um, it says in, in the 14th year, these kings started to rebel. They weren't going to serve Keterlamor anymore. They were sick of it. They rebelled. So he said, okay, I'm going to take my armies, those other four kings and their armies, and we're going to come against that set of five that I showed you, right? And so it says, first of all, they came and they defeated their Rephaim. Mm -hmm. Now, what does Rephaim mean? I have it in red. 
it, remember what Rephaim means? What, what, what is the Rephaim? Rephaim, Anakim, the Nephilim, they're all related. They're all half breeds, they're giants. all half yeah. angels, yeah. they're giants. So they were called Nephilim before the flood, but you'll see after the flood now oh, they're going to be Raphaim. called Raphaim. Yeah. And these are all over the land of Canaan. So Terah was told to get out of Babylon and with all that mixture of, of these evil creatures, you know, that aren't some of, most of them not even human. Their blood's getting polluted. He needs to preserve this line. He gets them out of there and he takes them up to Haran. But now he says to Abraham, now I'm going to send you in the midst of them because Canaan was full of giants. So people ask, if God's such a good God, why did he have all these tribes destroyed? And here's your answer. They're all giants. They were polluted with the blood of fallen angels. There was mixture, you know. There, there could, there could have been humans, but there were giants in the land, and that's the first thing, you know, Israel saw when they came out of Egypt after the 400 years. Are you following me? Are you with me? Yeah. Keeping up? Okay. So it says all the the Zubim, the Emim, the Horites. These are all the Nephilim or the Raphaim now, as they were called then. Okay, the Zuzim and the Emim. There's two other tribes. Yeah. Yeah. But it lists the Horites, which is by the wilderness. And we don't need to get into all that. The point is that Keter Lamor, he came, and basically these giants or these Raphaim were fighting other Raphaim. They were had a big fight. Because they don't, you know, the enemy doesn't like peace. He likes power and he likes destruction. He's a god of a uh, uh, lower, lower G god of destruction. So the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, the king of Admin, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, came out, and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Siddim, against, and then it names those other four kings. So, here's what happens. So they see Kedorlaomer and all these other kings coming, and then. King of Sodom and Gomorrah, they get out of there. It's like the captain abandoned the ship. They didn't stay to protect their people. They didn't stay. They just left. And a lot of them fell into tar pits. But we know that the king of Sodom had to have lived because we see him later on. Okay? So he might have fallen in, but somehow he got rescued out. But they just took off. And so these four kings from the east came. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and supply and departed. And they also took Lot, because he's living there in the city. They've been abandoned by the armies. They're there. Mm -hmm. And so he was taken in his possessions and he departed. Now, somebody escaped and they knew the connection between Abraham and Lot. So they knew pretty well, you know, um, they needed to go get Abraham. So whoever this guy was that escaped, he went over and told Abram the Hebrew. And do I have a map there for you? Not yet. I took it out for the sake of memory of <laughs> Jesse to get it over here. But there was he was living by the Oaks of Mamre. And I'm going to go find that map. This is the first time... That Abraham is, or Abram is mentioned as being a Hebrew. That means one who crossed the river or one who crossed. That's what, is, what that means. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's he's mentioned. It's mentioned there. So he's living in this area. If you go up to Masada, which we were just there last May, and you look out from the top of Masada, and you can see where there's now archaeological. Um, a discovery that they are pretty certain now is Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm going to bring photographs and some of the proof of that. But if you look out of Masada and up toward this direction, you can see this, it's, it looks like ash rock. You know, it's white. It's really white. And it looks kind of like the white salt stuff we have, rocks or we have around here, like on the way to Longmont or whatever, it, there's piles of white stuff. It kind of looks like that, but if you look, it's in like 90 degree. You can see 
like outlines of buildings. It, it looks like a city that had been burned and, and were ashes. Wow. And of course, you know, over the centuries, rain and stuff has um, kind of disintegrated and has fallen down into humps. But from the top, you can see outlines where it is clearly 90 degree angles and, and alleyways and things like that. Pretty interesting, we'll show you the pictures. So anyway, here's where, here's where Sodom was. Now, Keter had come way from over here and gone up because you have to go around the Dead Sea. They came up and came down and took these guys. So the, the messenger fled, came over here to where Abram is, and Abraham, Abram, sorry if I slip because it's so easy to say Abram. We did that. It's so, alkali. I'm sorry? It's alkali. When you see the white on the yeah, fields, it's alkali. alkali. Yeah, it looks like that. But, but it's ash. Okay? Going on. Now, any questions so far? Pretty clear? That's good. Um, so he, he came and he told Abram the Hebrew, and that's the first time, like Jack said, that word is used. And I could have I could have given you some of the etym etymology of that, but for the for our sakes and for the where we are in this class, we'll just say that's the first time he was called Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre and all these other people he had kind of lived with and made covenant with. And he heard that his relative had been taken captive, and he let out his trained men. Now, Jack could give you, Jack really uh, went extensively into the meaning of that. So these men, he had over 318. These were, these were just the trained soldiers. So if he had 300 trained fighting people, can you imagine how wealthy this guy was? I mean, that's the size, 300 is the size of the town I grew up in, you know? He had, he had a standing <laughs> army. Yeah. Basically. And, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, in Jack's notes, he said the emphasis, when it says trained, yes, they were trained to fight, but the emphasis were these men were dedicated to God. They, that was the first thing. Abraham place. led them to Yahweh. They accepted Yahweh. They were people of the faith. They were not just slaves anymore. They were sharers and brothers in the faith. Okay. And they stayed with Abraham or Abraham. And it says these were men born into his house. So, you know, these were young, strapping men, right? And it says they went as far as Dan, which is north of Damascus. I'm going to show you a map there. And he brought back all the goods, and he brought back his relative Lot. So with his 318 men, he defeated those four armies. There's something to be said about being on God's side, right? So, um, okay. I'm going to go to This the is next. why people tried to cut a covenant with Abram and Isaac, because they had a reputation mm -hmm. in that area that you just don't fool around with them and mess with them, otherwise you get... Yeah. And we'll talk about what co kind of covenant means. So here he is down in this area, Hebron. This is where Lot lived. He chased those kings all the way up. Dan is way up here. It's on the border of Lebanon. So it was a good 150 miles or more even so he went a long ways and he pursued them and of course he brought them back you said that was four yeah. armies he defeated what mm -hmm. oh i just want to make sure those first four kings that we saw earlier. he chased them to, to dan mm -hmm. where they decided to take a stand and fight and he fought them from dan over to damascus which is another 25 30 miles mm -hmm. and defeated them on the west side of damascus i mean so you can call them seals and green beret. Damascus is over uh -huh. here. They were tough, tough homers. Yeah, they were toughened in the wilderness because Hebron's wilderness. It's desert. It's rugged. You travel all that way and then be ready to Yeah. So 
here Melchizedek, we're going to see Melchizedek for the first time. So he, he has defeated these kings, and now he marches down. And the, the road that comes down through this area goes right through Jerusalem, which is, where is right Jerusalem? This is Bethlehem, right south of it. So he comes right through that area. You know what? Just keep that map in mind. Now, the king of Sodom has probably already come down, but he hears, you know, Abraham has now come back, and he's going to be meeting Abraham, not to thank him, but to get his stuff back. <laughs> he wants his stuff back. He wants his men and his, his things back. So we'll, we'll see that coming up here. So... After his return from the defeat of Kedarlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. So the king of Sodom, who had fled in the first place, heard about it, goes up, and wants to meet. Here's about Abraham. But someone else comes out. Now, I was, I was meditating on that, and I was thinking about this. And I feel like the Lord is speaking through this that whenever we have a great victory, you know, we're met with following that. Usually there's some kind of a wickedness or, you know, the king of Sodom really represents Satan. And so there's kind of a spiritual lesson here where he comes to meet Abraham and give back what he thinks is owed him. But at the same time, now Melchizedek, who Paul, who Paul acknowledges is a type of who? The priest, the high priest, Jesus. Melchizedek. Do you remember reading in Hebrews? I thought it was. Okay, that's your assignment. I want you to go read about Melchizedek in Hebrews because Paul connects these guys. Okay, Melchizedek guy. is not his name. This is his title. So Melchizedek means either king of righteousness or my king is righteous. Thank you. We'll just skip that he slide. The I'm king kidding. of Salem, which is the king of peace. So I thought it. I right. thought like in Jude. Saul of Jerusalem. In yeah. Jude, Jude talks about it. I thought it was one of the priests. He, he, he is. is. He's a priest and a king, right. and you only see so. that three times in the Bible, where there's a priest and king. Usually, the priests cannot be a king because they're ministering and representing God to the people. Or, or the king is, I guess. The priest is representing the, the people to God. So who, where's another time we see someone who's a king and a priest? Jesus. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Jesus. He's a king and a priest. What's the other time? Somebody else. <laughs> Let's get some input from some others. Who else? is called a king and a priest. Is it, can I answer that or no? Oh. Does anybody else know? What what do you what are your Well I think David was actually no, he was David king, was a priest. He wasn't he was a priest but no. he went into there like he was a priest. He was so, a king. Yeah. He was a king, so he was he not and he take the he took the bread like he was a priest though. So not really a priest, but he took it yeah. without punishment. He wasn't acting as a priest, but yeah, good point. He did go into the temple and took the, the bread, the show bread. The, bread, the other one the bread was given to him. The other the other entity that's called king and priest is us. We are kings and priests of the most high God. Think about that, how amazing that is, that he calls us not only because we are his sons, we're called kings and priests. <coughs> so Melchizedek is this really mysterious guy, he's the king of Salem. Now he brings out bread and wine. What is that saying? What is that? Why would he do that? When God is again setting up a type of it wasn't blood, you know, physical blood, but wine, the other name or word for wine, or for dom, which is translated blood, can be grapes, the fruit of the vine. They're the same word. Wow. Blood and the fruit of the vine. So here he's coming with a covenant, and he's setting up a type 
of our communion, of, of the co new covenant. And that's why he's symbolic of the new covenant priest. Is that awesome? That's amazing. So he comes and he brings bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. Now it's interesting, this is before the law or anything. And it says, he says to Abram, blessed, he blessed him, and he said, blessed be Abram of God Most High. Now that's the, and the possessor of heaven and earth. Now this is an important phrase, possessor of heaven and earth. Like Jack was pointing out to me as we were talking about this, the reason he could give Israel to Abram and all that land to Abraham because he possessed it and he could give it to whomever he wanted. Mm -hmm. Right? And he gave it to Abraham. Okay, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. He's creator. But Melchizedek points out something very important. He's not just a creator. It belongs to him. It's his. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he can give it to whomever he wishes. So, some scholars believe or think that maybe Abraham was in covenant with the king of Salem, Melchizedek, um, because he came out to meet him after that. And he, taught, he gave a tenth of all. So, is that... You know, here's where a tithe is first seen and established. Okay, so it's pre-law. So people who say, well, we're outside the law, we're new covenant, we don't have to tithe. Well, I personally believe we don't have to do anything because we're free from the law. But we see this as a principle, you know, because ble the word blessed, do you know what that word means? It means increase. Does the Lord bless you? He's saying the Lord increase you and prosper you. God is a God of blessing and increase if we believe and receive that blessing and walk it out. He, he wants us to be blessed. Now, I want to show you this because we, I, was gonna, I was showing you the map, you know, of how he came down through Jerusalem. And this is where he met Melchizedek. And the king of Sodom comes up there as well. But this is this is more just to give you an idea and a concept of how big the land is. So at its narrowest point, Israel is only 9.3 miles wide. You think of it, it's a country that it's a big country and they because all of the nations of the world are fighting over this little piece of property, its length from the top to the bottom is well, Colorado is bigger, wider from north to south. Colorado is maybe 20 miles, 20 or more miles longer. So this could fit, if this was the state of Colorado, wow. this would be just a little bit narrower and a, a little bit shorter. That gives you perspective of how big the country of Israel is. It's shocking. Because when you go to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it's just a few miles. You could walk it easily. You think about Mary and Joseph, and they had this big truck. Well, for a pregnant lady, it'd be pretty good. She's up in Na Nazareth, somewhere up higher, in higher, higher now by Nablus. Oh, there's Nazareth. Nazareth. Okay, so that was a good trek to there. But from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it's just a few miles. Hmm. So the other thing, Jerusalem is 27 square miles, and it's the, the city of Jerusalem, their capital, is about the size of our present-day Boulder, Colorado. It's, it, it, I'm talking about today's dimensions. It's not a very big city. And you, you know, there's only 7 million people or so that live in the entire country of Israel. And yet God has protected that with this Abrahamic covenant. It was so powerful that God protects this little nation. And if I, I, I was getting too many maps and pictures, but if you looked at like what's arid and what's farmable, little strips right along here, because of the Jordan River, is what they farm. And little strips along the sea, because of the moisture and stuff, and the, you know, some of the moisture they get from the sea is farmable here. This is all desert and mountain and rugged and, and dry. It's rock. There's not even, it's not even like Colorado with trees and stuff on it. It's just wilderness. 
wilderness, and yet they're producing fruit for the nations of the world. Wow. God has so blessed them. One of the things that's interesting about Israel is the main supplier of flowers, cut flowers to Europe. Really? Yeah. They ship them to Europe. Huh. So if you think about how tiny that country is, in comparison to all the nations around it, and they're all wanting it. Why is that? See, there's something spiritual about that. So Melchizedek, he was the king of righteousness, because it means uh, El is king, or Kizedek, or Tzedek, Melk, Melchi, that's what it is. Melchi is a king. And Zedek is, Zedek is righteousness or holiness. Okay, he was the king of Jerusalem. They said Salem. Now that's what now peace. Jerusalem is peace. called. City of peace. City of peace. He brings bread and wine. He's a priest and a king. Abram bears ties to the king of righteousness. Now I found this interesting. I did a little research, and this all happened. They met in what they call the Valley of Shiva. How, what? There's, that's got to be saying something, you know, that word. It means in the likeness, or to be compared to, to the equivalent of it. I'm thinking, what's that got to do with them meeting there in that place? I um, wonder if I got rid of the map I didn't intend to get rid of. Nope, there it is. This is a, a map of the city of Jerusalem. <laughs> They mention one of these valleys, these are valleys, okay, in Jerusalem. This is the Kidron Valley. Um, the Mount of Olives is here where Jesus is going to return. There's a big valley, and then you go up to the temple, you know, where now the Dome of the Rock and all that is. So it's a real steep walk down and another steep walk up into the temple area. So this is the Kidron Valley. Some people think that they met in the Kidron because it's also called the Valley of Kings. But that it's prehistoric to what a lot of the Bible talks about. There's another, it's called the Central Valley, and then there's the Hinnom Valley. And the Hinnom Valley, if you think of, um, is, this is where they burned their garbage and refuge. They dumped it over. And, and these are really deep ravines. Okay, this has been filled up by... Romans coming in and tearing down the city and throwing it down into the ravines. So, but it's still a good seat measure. Now, if you look at this, these valleys, there's a scripture that says, I will write my name on this city. Do you see what this is? We talked about the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. This is called a shin. Can you tell me about the shin? You get to. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the letters that represent God in the name of God. It's the sh in Yeshua. It's a shin. It's an S H sound. A shin. Huh. And it says, He will write His name on this city. And literally, these valleys create this shin wow. on, the, on the Mount of Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. How many of you know anything about Star Trek? A little bit. Do you know who Spock is? Yep. What is... Something like that. Go back there. To oh, the Spock is a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shim. Yeah, he did that on purpose. That is a shim. Really? And they had to glue yes. uh, uh, Kirk's fingers together. <laughs> To be able to do that, because he couldn't do that. He but, but yeah, he, he purposely did that. And his piece of information you can carry around with you the rest of your life now. Real important to the faith. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting, though. Yeah, did I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. So, How can you do that? we're, we're I going back. Know. I Is wanted to show you. It. Shin and sin, but they have, they're separated by a dot. So how do you know that's the shin and not the sin? Because because he would write his name upon it. That's why. Okay. Yeah. What, what were your questions? Well, you know, in the Hebrew alphabet, there's the shin and the sin, but it's depicted by the dot. Okay. For purposes of study, if you see a dot here, 
over the shin, over this, this here. It's pronounced shin. If the dot's over here, it's It's an S sound. Okay. So here's, because God always teach, you know, speaks in patterns, and you can, you can um, read, read out of these things. You can't necessarily prove it by the text. But I believe it was in this valley that they met when he came down from the north. And here's why. Because this valley of Kidron, this is where Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he went into the garden and he sweat great drops of blood. And he had to yield his will. He had to give that tithe of himself, was his, you know, his will, that part of him that said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And you go down here and you follow this valley around and somewhere about right in here, perhaps in the same area, is what's called the garden tomb. And this, this area is called Mount Moriah. Oh. We're going to see in Genesis, as you read, Abraham took Isaac to what mount? Moriah. It was Mount Moriah where he offered his son. I was going to. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, he did. He literally was dead to himself. But it, this is the area on that very mountain where David took the head of Goliath and buried it in this area. In Golgotha, right? Mm-hmm. In Golgotha, which is called the place of the skull. In Golgotha, which is I called the place of the skull. Called, yeah, because he buried it. Right. They believe right. that they got that name from Goliath's head being buried in the place of the skull. Yeah. There's a lot of connections cool. here. But I believe this was a foreshadowing now of Abram coming down. So, but is that amazing? In these very places where this happened, where he paid the tithe, this is also where Yeshua with, or Jesus would be sacrificed and shed his blood in covenant, the same place where Abraham was willing to shed his son's blood. Nothing is incidental when it's written in the word. There's always a reason. And you can get really rewarded if you keep seeking and digging and finding these nuggets, you know, in the word. So now the king of Sodom is there, and <laughs> he's saying, uh, give the people to me, and he says, okay, I'll give you the goods. You can take whatever you got back. And, and Abraham said to him, I have sworn to the Lord God most high. Now he heard Melchizedek call him God most high, and this is the first time he's using the same name, God most high, because there are a lot of people around there calling themselves gods. You know, the Raphim love to be gods and worship and he said, the God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, for fear you would say, I've made Abraham rich. Right? And he would have. Mm -hmm. King of Sodom would have boasted because Abraham was, Abraham was known all over that place. He was well known and established himself. And he said, I'll take nothing except the young men, what they've eaten. And he said, and give a portion of some of that what they, they would like to take, but not me. Give it to my men. Okay. So then we, we have this chapter, and I, I'm not going into the background too much again, but there's three, three times that God promises that Abram would have descendants, like, you know, the stars. He promises him an heir. Um, he actually promises him seven times, or eight times, I think I counted. Eight times, but on the third time, um, it says, he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And the third time, God, God kept giving him the promise. But the first two times, it's pretty obvious he didn't believe it. Because it says here, this third time, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it. The Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. We see that again in Romans, don't we? 
where it says, because Abraham believed God, it was given to him as righteousness. And he was talking about our faith. That we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be reckoned righteous through that belief. So Abraham, Abraham had a struggle with that. Um, because, because before that, in that chapter, what, it was, what had happened is God had made him a promise. And he says, well then, maybe Eliezer, my servant, he'll have a son and I'll adopt Eliezer's kids. And that's going to be my heirs. And he said, no. Mm -hmm. He's going to come from your body. It's going to be yours. Look at the stars. That's how many descendants you're going to have. Wow. That's amazing to think about, right? Yeah. So he said to the Lord, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldees to give you the land to possess it. And so here's another promise of the land. And the Lord, Lord, how will I possess it? Now he's asking about the land. And he said, bring me a three-year-old heifer. Now this is a really big deal. Because he's about to enter into a blood covenant. I wish I had time to share with you the intricacies and the power of a blood covenant. In essence, all those tribes in the Middle East still do it. They understand it. Americans don't. Because smaller tribes will do what they call cutting a covenant with a more powerful tribe. Now when you do that, the smaller tribe inherits everything that the bigger tribe has, and the bigger tri tribe gets the smaller tribe stuff. They exchange. And, and in, in the case of a covenant, if there's a blood covenant between a fa couple family members or parents and children, when one dies, then that covenant or testament is released to the heir, right? So in a blood covenant, um, Blood, of course, has to be shed, and then they typically, we'll see this here pretty soon. So God said, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought all these, he cut them in two, and laid each half opposite each other, but he did not cut the birds. Now why would he lay them up, why would he not cut the birds? So something like this, and I believe it's probably a little closer together than that, but, but he didn't cut the birds. So what is this symbolic of? We're looking for Jesus in all of this. Types and symbols of Jesus. Looks like a tree. These are half animals. These are, you know, the goat and the calf and whatever. These are the birds. This is the blood running through here. What would these represent? We know from the law that God established. That the blood cleanses us. Mm -hmm. The life of us, our soul, is in the blood, right? And the, 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 where did the blood come from? Is it our blood? No. It comes from a sacrifice. There has to be a sacrifice. These things are symbols of our Messiah, of Jesus. That he had to be sacrificed. And each of these sacrifices represented a, a part of what Abraham was going to receive. Possession, children, mm -hmm. lands, blessing. What do the, if these represent Jesus, what do the birds represent? The, Spirit. the birds, birds, Good birds always represent the Spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit. Look for these patterns, and then you can begin to pick up and interpret and understand things in the Old Testament that are revealed in the New Testament. So the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Then the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So you put, begin to put them together, and it means we have to study, right? A good student of this, and we can begin to see the patterns. When Jesus was baptized, the dove came down. And that was the Holy Spirit who came down in the form of a dove, a white bird. So he entered in as part of the sacrifice. Yeah, so it was it was representing the wealth, the weapons. So 
when tribes do this, for example, in Africa, they exchange weapons. If a small tribe is attacked by another tribe, the large tribe, because of the covenant, comes and protects them and keeps them safe. You'll see this covenant exchange between Jonathan and David. They exchanged weapons or whatever. So you see that in, in a lot of patterns in the, in the Old Testament. So they get protection, they exchange gifts, even the debt is shared, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I won't get into it in this study, but when, when this happens, they are going to be walking through the blood. The blood. And they call that, they call this the way of the blood. It has a name. And they walk through this path that they call the way of the blood. Now, what are we really talking about here? What did Jesus say he was? The way. <laughs> and they shorten this. They call it the way. Jesus said, when Jesus was saying to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can get to the Father except through me. You have to walk this way. Isn't that powerful? That's what he was revealing, that this is a covenant. And, and they understood that, that when he said, I am the way, it was a known, well-known phrase in cutting covenant back then. So they understood what he was saying. So what they did is they would, would walk in a figure eight. I just drew this by hand. You know how computers are, right? But they would walk in a figure eight through this, the two parties. Now, God wasn't quite there yet, but Abraham would have done this. He would have, in walking with the spiritual nature of God, would have done this figure eight. It's interesting thing about a figure eight, the number eight is the number of new beginnings, but um, as Lorna pointed out to Jack, it's also the symbol for infinity. Now it doesn't look like it here, but if I had drawn it correctly, it would have looked like this. So, so that there is eternity, eternal life going on here. In other words, it's an eternal covenant. Now, going back to the text, the last thing, birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Adam drove them away. I mean, Abram. What would the birds of prey symbolize? What do we see in the New Testament of birds coming? Is that the parable of the seed? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. And what did the birds represent? What did Jesus say that was? said it was Satan coming to snatch the word away. So the birds were trying to come and stop the covenant. Satan was trying to come and carry in and prevent this covenant from happening. Okay? In your life, when you make commitments to the Lord, the one thing to be aware of, and cover yourself in the blood, is that you will be challenged in those covenants. There is a demonic challenge. In all of them. Mm-hmm. It's... Whenever you enter into something. Now, that's another thing about a covenant. As opposed to a contract, you make a house contract. There's people that don't pay, right? They break the contract. People break contracts all the time. Companies and business deals. A covenant is not a contract. A covenant is a life commitment. It does not end. And a blood covenant will never end. In African tribes, Dr. Livingston, when he went over, he said, I never once saw anyone ever break a blood covenant. It just would not be done. It would be at the expense of one another's lives. Do you remember lives. how many scars she had? Was it 20-some? Who? Livingston. I don't remember, but Jack's talking about Dr. Livingston in order to be able to live and move among the tribes, he cut covenant with a whole bunch of tribes. The main tribes. And he had, he had all the scars 
and he, he had the protection of virtually every tribe on the continent of Africa. He could go wherever he wanted oh, that's what I because he had the scars to prove, mm -hmm. you better leave me alone, otherwise these guys are going to come after you. Not only that, he was also using that as an illustration of the covenant God cuts with us and led many to the Lord because of that. So isn't that good? So now what's happened? So the birds come, he chases them away. It's getting super dark. Now a darkness, an eerie darkness, a supernatural darkness comes upon this place. Same kind of darkness that we'll see in, one, in the plagues or the same darkness that we saw in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. It was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The word kozak. It's a supernatural darkness where you can't see anything, but it's spiritual as well. It's so dark that, you know, you, you just feel like death upon you. It, it was that kind of a darkness, and he was afraid. He said great terror fell upon him, this darkness was on him. And in this terror, God was bringing prophecy. Now, a lot of people miss this, but he is showing what's going to happen to his descendants. Look at this. God said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. What's he talking about? Egypt. No. Egypt. Yeah. Joseph going down to Egypt. So they were there about 430 years, but the first 30 years, they knew Joseph. And then they became slaves for 400 years. It was very precise in the number of years. Oh, the crown. And I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. Yeah. God was speaking very precisely and specifically. And he did, because they took everything with them. Yeah. Yeah. They gave it to them. Yeah. Hundreds of years Please before. Yeah, yeah. Please take it. <laughs> yeah. Before it ever happened. Yeah, Red get out of here. Red I don't want any more plagues. <laughs> right. As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace and you will be buried at a good old age. And then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Ammonite is not yet complete. Now that's pretty amazing. The iniquity of the Amorite is not complete. These guys were as iniquitous as you could get. They were evil. But there is a certain level that God will deal with in evil, you know, before he judges it. So he's saying, well, they haven't quite gotten there. The cup of iniquity is not quite full. And it came about with the sunset. It was very dark. And there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. And just for the sake of time, I'm not going to have you guess. It's what I saw it as. He was giving him this prophecy of his descendants. And they would be brought out after 400 years. And he showed them... A smoking oven and a flaming torch. Well, if you go into the original language, it's, it's really talking, I believe, about a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Huh. And what did it do? It says, they pass between these pieces. It's also a prophetic thing that I will open up. I'm going to split the Red Sea. No accident is called a Red Sea. It's a sea of blood, mm -hmm. right? They went through that sea. So who is who? Who is the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? Who was that? God. Obviously, God led them. He appeared in this form, and He was revealing themselves. Do you have anything to add to that, Jack? Well, I would assume that the pillar of fire, the torch of fire, would be the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and he no, says, no, I, no, 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 a smoking furnace. And it was, well, that's why I said it's, um, I feel like it could be the cloud of glory, because in that it talks about there is a, sh the root word to that means shimmer. So there's a shimmering in the clouds, and it's speaking of God's glory. But for the sake of time, how are we doing? So, I was wrong, the torch would be Jesus, and the furnace, and the smoking furnace would be God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. That's why, what I was saying. I, I have one question. I saw on one of the maps there was an age that somebody died at 175. A right old age. Okay. Now, yes. did they count age back then as we count age now? Yeah. Okay. A year is a year. Okay. Yeah. 
We don't live as long as they do. Yeah. Uh, they also eat better. Sure uh, they didn't have McDonald's. They didn't have McDonald's. No, yeah. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't. They had a lot of they, lamb. They have had lamb, bread, and fish. <laughs> <laughs> bread and wine, right? So this next part talks about you know Sarah and Abram, and they born him no children, and so that's when they decide to operate in the flesh. Here, take my maid, Sarah says, and Abraham was willing to do that. And what happens is Hagar conceives, and now she's arrogant. Pride gets to her, and she starts putting Sarai down. She felt like she was now superior to Sarai because it was such a shame for Middle Eastern women to not bear conceive, children yeah. and, and not conceive. So she said to Abram, I mean, it was kind of her idea in the first place, go ahead, do this. Right. Now, in the New Covenant, or the Old Covenant, there is a principle in the, in the laws of Leviticus where if a husband makes a vow and he doesn't keep it, that's on his head. But if a wife makes a vow and can't keep it, and the husband hears about it and does nothing about it, he's responsible for her breaking that covenant because he is her covering. Okay? So here, Sarah said, well, let's do this. And, but Abraham agreed. He could have said, and he had the right to say, no way. God said it's going to be my, you know, our heir. And, but he's trying to do things in the flesh, help that out. And once you get into rationalizing, we're in trouble because we produce sons of the flesh. So she said, the, the wrong upon me, and, and it means an unnatural violence, a malicious, cruel hatred. So the, this Hagar was pretty cruel to her, and she couldn't stand it anymore. This is when she was despised. Hagar placed her in her eyes in a lower position. She was her slave. She was her handmaiden for Pete's sake. And it says there, it, it's like a curse, or she was made despicable. Right. So it, it got unbearable for Sarah, and she cries out. She says, Abraham, you're responsible for it. He has to right the wrong. Yeah, get rid of her. It's up to him. So he goes, well... She's your maid, do what you want in your power. So he's kind of a passive guy with, you know, in some ways. Um, this talks about when, I'm, I'm going to move on. They were at this, they were at a spring. Um, so she kicked her out, she goes to a spring, and something occurs here. Um, she's about to die, and she's fleeing from the presence of Sarai, and it says, um, she was headed to, they think she was headed toward back to Egypt. She was headed south. And probably because that's where he got her and that was her homeland. But an angel comes to her because now there is an heir and this is Abraham's heir after all. And he has covenants with Abraham. So he's got, the, the Lord has to intervene here. And the angel told her, I'm going to multiply your descendants too. And there'll be too many to count. And the angel of the Lord said, you're with child, you're going to have a son, here's what you're going to name him, and he's going to be a wild donkey of a man, and just look at the Middle Eastern culture, you know, they're pretty wild and violent. So she goes back, and she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? She recognized this wasn't just an angel, that this was a manifested, pre-incarnate Jesus. Because you can't see the Father and live under, under the law. So this is what theologians call a theophany, where it's an appearance of the Godhead that's possibly, probably Jesus in his, before he's incarnated through a woman. Okay? his eternal form before he took the form of a human. So, and therefore the well was called Bir Laharoi. Behold, it is between, and it says where it is, um, because he's a God who sees, okay? So Hagar bore Abram's son, and he called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. 
was 86 years old when she bore Ishmael to him. We could go on, but now he's 99 and the Lord makes another covenant with him. And um, Jack, I guess, will be teaching that next week. I'm, I don't feel like, I feel like it would take too much time, but it has to do with, um, he, he's called Abraham, Abram up until this time, and then we'll begin to see that God says to him from now on, we're gonna, you're going to have a circumcision, so another blood covenant. There are many kinds of covenants. Marriage is a blood covenant. It's intended to be in this culture. That's been kind of decimated, but the intent was to, for two virgins to come together, and, and when they consummated the marriage, there would be blood in the parent. The parents... Um, made sure that they kept those sheets to prove that she was a virgin. And if he ever said, well, she wasn't a virgin, they could show the sheets and say, no, she is a virgin. And they hmm. show the blood. Um, so marriage is a blood covenant. There's a blood covenant. The wo a woman carries, when every month, the woman demonstrates the blood covenant that there can't be life conceived and come out of a womb without that blood. So it is, it's really a demonstration of the cross every month. And, you know, I share that with young girls who were just distraught it, because it's kind of a traumatic thing for, for a girl when she gets her period. And, but if she understands and you can tell your daughters, this, this really is a portrayal of, of Jesus and the life that comes forth. Out of, out of the shedding of his blood for us. Hmm. So it's another very powerful symbol. Um, so all through this thing we'll see the blood covenant come, you'll see it again and again. And that's why the blood, it has to be pure and, and perfect for a Messiah. And that, that's kind of what I really wanted to emphasize tonight. So um, any questions? We're going to talk next time about the circumcision, which represents, God says, he, w he was circumcised in his body, but we have to be circumcised in our heart. And that's when his name changes. And Jack will talk about that next time. So yeah. it's, when they talk about circumcision, it's not what a man goes through after he's born. No, it is. Oh, okay. That's the Old Covenant. Old Testament. Okay. After Jesus, for those of us who aren't Jews and may not be physically circumcised, a lot of people are, some aren't, a lot of them aren't. <laughs> He's talking about our circumcision to be grafted into Abraham is when our heart is circumcised by the new birth. Okay. Paul says to the people, he asks the question, who is a Jew? You know, that's a good question. Who is a Jew? And they had a hard time answering. He said, he, he is a Jew, not of the flesh, but a circumcision of the heart. He is a Jew. So the, the, in the Old Testament, it's the circumcision of the flesh, which is a sign of being of the faith. Paul says, it's not that way anymore. It's got to be a circumcision of the heart. Okay. They are Jews. So I like to be followed. People say, uh, you're a Jew. <laughs> if you're anti-Semitic, you hate yourself. Because you're a Jew. If you're a believer, <laughs> except in Jesus, and you're circumcised of your heart, you're a Jew. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get into circumcision next week. And we'll see another theophany, a manifestation of... What is a theophany? What is a theophany? Jesus came pre before he was in the flesh. The pre-incarnate... What does pre-incarnate mean? Do we understand what pre-incarnate means? Carnate, carnal, flesh, before he was before born he was born. in the flesh through a virgin. So it's incarnate, pre-incarnate. Mm -hmm. like well, his, his, I mean, it was a physical body, but it was his eternal body before he gave that 
likeness of God. Remember Philippians says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard that equality with God a thing to be grasped, and he emptied himself and became in the form of a human. He came be born of flesh and blood. So would that be the same form he took after he was resurrected? No, it says no, because forever, and that's the, this is something that awes me to the, down to my toes and back up again, that he would forever take on the form of a human, being found in the likeness of flesh, it says, being, become sinful flesh for us. And because he, and he became as a servant, and it says because he did that, therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. And he raised him up and he seated him at God's right hand as the son. Now, in that pre-incarnate form, um, you know, we don't know that, you know, they called him an angel because they didn't have a name for, you know, they... God had kept that peace hidden from Satan, remember? Yeah, Moses wrote this part, so he hadn't known that form of Jesus yet. Right, exactly. In the Bible, it's my opinion, where you see the Bible talks about angels, you've got to be very careful. It'll say, and an angel appeared unto them. That's fine. But in other places, it says, the angel of God. The angel mm -hmm. of the Lord. A definite article, the angel of God, in my opinion, is talking about Jesus. Now, in chapter 15, or 16, when God is talking to uh, Hagar, um, um, I am, my, I'm fleeing from my mistress, and said to her, Melach Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, said, return to your mistress and yield yourself under her hands and, she, and said to her, Malach Yahweh, greatly I will multiply your seed and I will, it will not be counted for multitude. And said to her, Malach Yahweh, see, you will be with child and shall bear his son. You will call his name Ishmael. So, yes. Malach Yahweh. The angel, the, the angel, angel of the Lord, of not the Lord. an angel. Not an angel. Now, when I want you guys to read next week, the next few chapters, and be prepared, so you have, you know, look for these things. But it I, again, you will see some angels come to visit Abraham and Sarah. All right, but we see another uh, manifested presence of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, because they didn't. That was. The, they didn't have any other terminology. They knew this was a great spirit being. You can tell angels when you're around them if they have just come from heaven. There is an emanation. There's something that emanates. There's such power and authority and what you know. It's it's not like an angel who's been here on earth and that kind of fades and they're around humans like your guardian angel. Um, these angels that come directly from heaven. They, there is a, such a sense where you get the you sense the, the fear of the Lord because you because what their holiness does it's like it's like a mirror and it reflects back to you how you're sinful how that sin looks to you you see it in the presence of such holiness that's why Daniel fell down on his face before God and I you know I had one experience where there is such power and authority and glory. Because I thought, well, in Jesus, we wouldn't, you know, he's our, he's our friend, right? We wouldn't feel that way. But when you, when you come from the presence of God, or when they come from the presence of God, there is a power that is vibrating like thunder. And, I, you know, I, it's hard to describe, but there is such an awesomeness that you... you can't help but tremble and shake in that, you know. And the only thing that keeps us alive in the presence of God is the blood of Jesus, the covering the covenant we have with the blood. Does that make sense? So they recognized that these people were not mere humans, you know. 
when Lorna was talking about carnate and pre-incarnate, the best and easiest way is to remember the Messiah is before Jesus. And so when the Messiah appears in Scripture as the angel of the Lord, he is a pre-incarnate, before the flesh appearing, before the coming of the Messiah in flesh, he's appearing here. In other words, the Messiah is appearing in spirit as pre-incarnate, before he became flesh. That's all it means. Now, Jesus is the incarnate Christ. Well, he's here. He's not pre anymore. He's now here. So it's, it's, it's just terminology. Don't get, don't get befuddled. The Messiah always was with the, with the Father from the beginning. You find that out, and it verifies that in Scripture. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with the Lord, with, with the Father, and Father, and... With God. And the Word and, was. And the Word was with God. And the, God was the Word. The Messiah was always there. Okay. All three of them. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Always there. Well, let's pray. Okay? Father, we, we thank you that tonight, just the revelation of what you gave for us in this blood covenant that you made with us is so much beyond our comprehension of what love is and what love has done. And the fact that you would give up for all eternity that form to become come the nature of a man. Father, we're, we're just awed by your love, Jesus. And I pray that tonight, that this word would transform hearts, every one of our hearts. There would be a transformation, that we would be moving from glory to glory as we hear the word and we are changed in your presence, Lord, and we're changed um, by the revelation of just Jesus and the gift that he is. We thank you for the covenants that you said in our blood covenant with Jesus that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We inherit everything that he inherits from the Father, that every spiritual gift in the heavenly places belongs to us. And Father, I ask that we live up to that call that we are kings and priests. I ask that we grow into that and take that identity that you've put upon us and we are the we are the worthy kings and priests that we are worthy vessels to carry that the weight of that calling lord so transform us and let us let us just move even from victory to victory from glory to glory until we we attain to that goal and that upper call of god in christ jesus and I thank you for that impartation. I just sense that tonight. I'm just going to move. You know, as the Holy Spirit is just showing me, just we just haven't asked for an impartation of that higher level of glory that you would impart, the, that identity that you are a king and a priest and that you are a, a member of the royal family. And Father, we just thank you. Thank you for that impartation and that growth in grace. We ask that you just release that now over to Sheena, that she is a royalty in the courts of God, and that she lives and moves, and that she would take up that servanthood, that willingness to lay down her life just as Jesus did, that she would lay it down and, and release a sacrifice and as, as as we've entered into this covenant, this blood covenant, that there would be a new identity, a circumcision of heart, and that we move, we speak to you and we say, you are moving, you're coming up higher from glory to glory, an impartation of your glory and your identity, Lord Jesus. Just thank you, Father, for that, in Jesus' name. This is, one, this is one of my jokes. <laughs> there are three people that are talked about in the Bible who have no parents, no father or mother. Who are they? Adam and Eve. Well, I'll say that. Skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a father, though. 
Melchizedek is one. Most people don't get this one. Who was the leader of the Israelites in the Promised Land and is conquering? Okay. It's conquering so I... Joshua. Okay. He had no father and mother. He was a son of none. Lord. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> well, his dad's name was Anuet. <laughs> That's a, a jack joke. He's a, he's a son of none. <laughs>